Good day, ladies and gentlemen, uh, joining us from all corners of the world. My name is Bongiwe Tutu from the Africa China Reporting Project in Johannesburg, South Africa. And I will be hosting today's Africa China Training Forum with my colleague Kobus van Staden, the China Africa Project's Director of Research and Analysis. Kobus, hello, how are you? I'm very good, thanks, Bongiwe. Thanks so much for the invitation. It's great to be here. Oh, great. So welcome everyone to the 17th African Investigative Journalism Conference. And this is Africa's biggest annual gathering. And this year, AIJC has expanded exceptionally, not only virtually and in person, but simultaneously from five African cities in Nairobi, in Kenya, in Addis Ababa, in Ethiopia, in Abuja, in Nigeria, Dakar in Senegal and here in Johannesburg, South Africa. And the reach and the impact of this gathering is a rich indication of the dynamism of the Witt Center for Journalism. And this is, this is despite the challenges that are presented by the COVID-19 pandemic to our times and our ways of work. And this uh, Africa-China Training Forum is further indication of the hybrid media facilitation and training amidst the pandemic and will showcase the work of the project and its partnerships with um, other organizations to continue to support journalists through skills training and development, networking and capacity building, uh, reporting grants, reporting resources, and other opportunities. So this forum will specifically showcase the work of the Africa China Reporting Project and of its partners, namely the China Africa Project, the Center for Investigative Journalism in Malawi, the Information for Development Trust in Zimbabwe, and the Paradigm Initiative in Nigeria. So, Kobus, I will in a bit be asking you to introduce our speakers before we get into the program, but let me first notify our attendees that you can follow us on Twitter at Vits China Africa and Facebook at Vits China Africa Reporting Project. You can also live tweet using the hashtag AIJC2021. And for any questions or comments, you can engage with us on the chat and the Q&A functions here on Zoom or via the Wolver app. And just to briefly um, inform everyone of the running order, so Quobus will be introducing our speakers in the order of the program, and thereafter we will swiftly get into the presentations. Then once all speakers uh, have presented, we will have about 20 minutes for discussion, and we will take some questions uh, from attendees if there are any. And I'd just like to inform our speakers um, that if you have any questions to some of the presentations that have been given or any related points for consideration or discussion that you would like to add, please feel free to do so in the discussion part of the program um, and um, so that we can have a full engagement rather than a, a rigid Q&A. So, Krobus, um, over to you. Thanks so much, Bongiwe. Um, so our, our first speakers will be uh, me and Eric Olander. Uh, we, we jointly run the, the China Africa project and we'll be introducing some, some kind of like notable talking points on, on the China Africa space particularly. Um, then we'll be joined by Colin Santika, uh, who's a senior investigative journalist at the Center for, in for Investigative Journalism in Malawi. Um, Tawanda Majoni, who's uh, the national coordinator um, for the information for Information for Development Trust, um, and then Khadija um, Al Usman, uh, who's the program officer for Anglophone West Africa for the Paradigm Initiative. So we, we're really thrilled to have everyone here. Um, so, I, yeah, go ahead, Bongi, sorry. No, I was just going to say you guys can go ahead with, with your presentation. Over to you, um, and Eric. Fantastic. So I'll, I'll start off. Um, what we wanted to do, we realized that the, the, the China Africa space is a very crowded one and there's lots going on. So we wanted to try and kind of just provide a little bit of focus to, sh to give you some of the biggest stories that, that, we're, that, that we're looking at, um, at the mo this year. So I'm going to be looking at two, the, the FOCAC Summit um, and new data on lending. And then I'm going to hand over to Eric to, for two related and, and very interesting issues in extract 
factors, looking at cobalt and also looking at coal. Um, so this year, like, like if, if you're already like feeling a little bit lost when I just like throw, throw out acronyms like FOCAC, like the, the FOCAC stands for the Forum on China Africa Cooperation. Um, it's the big three yearly summit that brings together leaders from all over the African continent and Chinese leaders. This year, it's probably taking place in November, in late November, early December. Um, and it's happening in Dakar, um, but also online. Um, there's the, it seems unlikely that President Xi Jinping is going to is going to be traveling outside of China. Um, so the thing to look at for at FOGAC is in the first place. There's over the over the last two decades, we've always seen that that every time in the, at the FOGAC summit, there's some kind of massive announcement of a financing target. Like the last two summits have been sixty billion dollars in in financing targets, like you know, kind of like like announced there. The issue is, as as, as I'll show you in a moment, the, the, like there's been a lot of shifts in Chinese financing to Africa, and the, the question is is whether we're going to be seeing a number. This year, is there going to be a big, a big financing target announced? And if not, how is it going to be kind of massaged? So that I think is a is a really interesting data point, and and you know, kind of that's something to look out for. Like in the past, <clears throat> the you know, like the folk, the folk like agenda is kind of like stretched and shrunk, you know, kind of over time, uh, mostly stretched. It, it kept kind of expanding. What we're looking at this year is focus on infrastructure. Um, now, infrastructure has always been uh, is always an issue in Africa-China relations, but um, there's major shifts happening, and, and it's going to be very interesting to see what what particular infrastructure they're talking about this time. Um, we're looking at a, a large emphasis on digital engagement. Um, <clears throat> so Chinese tech companies are making massive kind of inroads in Africa. Um, and it's happening against the background of, of, of all of this pressure coming from Western countries about working, working with Chinese tech companies like Huawei, for example. So look for, look for what they call the digital Silk Road um, being, being a, kind of a big ticket issue at, at FOGAC this year. Then um, we're looking at green development, um, and as Eric will also also note, there's this big shifts in in the in kind of the kinds of electricity that China is, is funding, and we were expecting to see the announcement of, of, of several kind of green energy projects, maybe. Um, then also agriculture. Agriculture is really emerging as a new space um, in, in uh, Africa-China engagement, it's particularly on, in the relation to trade. So, you know, I think there, there may well be a lot of action on the agriculture front. So the beyond FOCAC, um, and just to give you some context that you can also draw in on in your, your reporting on FOCAC, the big story of this year has been actually over the last two years is that there's been really massive shifts in the way that China finances different projects in Africa. So what we saw all the way through and particularly at FOCAC summits is these kind of announcements of these massive numbers of, of you know, kind of like multi-billion dollar kind of like fund, funding packages frequently funded by two large Chinese state banks, the, the, the um, China Exim Bank and the China Development Bank. What we've seen over the last two years is that those two banks have really retreated. Like they've really started, like they, they've become a lot more hesitant about lending, um, particularly around, around kind of controversies around debt distress in Africa. Um, so that is really reshaping the, um, the kind of project landscape in Africa. What we're seeing instead is a multiplication of Chinese lenders. There's suddenly many commercial banks, state-owned companies, and so on, like many different actors, like lending money at a very different terms. Um, what we've also seen is a lot new, a lot of new research, particularly over the last two, the amazing new research coming out over the last two months um, about about new, like like new insights in Chinese lending. So, like these include the like finding billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars of, of off-book debt that, that has been sitting kind of hiding in plain sight, 
um, guaranteed by states, but frequently not directly to states. Um, so it's, you know, what we've recently seen, uh, those of you who have been, who've been following the, the debt situation in Zambia will see that that there's new, uh, like about two weeks ago, so there's this kind of these new reports came out that, that showed that the, the amount of, chi of, of, of Chinese loans held by Zambia is actually a lot more than had previously been anticipated. So expect those kinds of bombs coming out to like these kind of scandals coming out over, uh, you know, in, in, in relation to several countries across the global south and, and, and in Africa. Um, so, you know, the, when, you know, I just want to like urge a little bit of caution when you report about that. So, A, obviously debt and macroeconomics is complicated. Um, so it's, you know, it's, 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 it's important to do your, to do your homework. In this particular case, it's also, there's a lot of disinformation in the space. So you're gonna come under a lot of, of temptation and, um, and even high level people you speak to are gonna be talking about the idea that China is indebting countries to then seize assets. So there's gonna be, there's gonna be a story like, even from, from African uh, government officials, and particularly when you speak to Western officials, like State Department officials, for example, you're definitely gonna come across a story that, 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 that China is indebting countries in order to take away their ports, to take away their pipelines, take away their mines. There is no case where that has happened. Um, there's no asset seizures has happened. Even like everyone will, will mention a, a particular port in Sri Lanka, even that is not an, an example of this case. What you will see instead is is more is issues around, for example, the garnishing of the profits from some of these assets. So, for example, there, there's been a, a big controversy in, in Kenya around around whether the Mombasa port will be taken away. It won't. What will be taken away possibly is some of its profits in order to re, to 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 um, to repay these Chinese loans. So this. This lending stuff is really important and super important for Africa, particularly because it, it has massive implications for both for African development and for the future of, uh, you know, kind of uh, the, the kind of future economies of, of Africa uh, who will now be sitting with a lot of these debts. But one needs to trade carefully. Um, read these re reports, like there's a few big research institutions that, that do these reports. One is called Aid Data, another one is called the China Africa Research Initiative, and the third one is called the Global Development Policy Center at Boston University. Those are the three big ones. They, um, their reports are long, it's like we, we're talking hundreds of pages, um, and dense. So what we suggest is that you come to China Africa Project, which is, which is you know, kind of our, our service, because we have been following this stuff obsessively for the last two years. And we, um, we interviewed all of the big ex experts. So there's podcast after podcast after podcast where people explain these things. And so there are some of the world's experts dealing with these things, and, but we, keep in mind, are not economists. So we start from a very low level. <laughs> when we speak to these people, we're like, so what is sovereign debt? Um, you know, and then you go from there. So, so we would suggest that if you, like in order to get a handle on it, particularly because this is a space with so much disinformation in it as well, it like to, to kind of read the documents and then listen to all of these podcasts, you know, kind of, and then they'll kind of position you and then you can move from there. So, um, so I don't wanna kind of, you know, take up too much of, of time. I'm, I'm handing over to Eric now um, and he'll uh, give you two kind of like big like like new kind of emerging dynamics that we're seeing in the extractive space in the China Africa extractive space. Sure thanks Kobus and uh, great to be back at the AIJC. Um, so first I think just to follow up on Kobus was talking about again there's a lot of misunderstanding and misinformation uh, and disinformation in the China Africa space in African coverage of China. Much of it is very poorly informed. One of the biggest mistakes that a lot of people make when covering China is, and this is a common problem across Africa, is that they will look at the Chinese as just an extension or a different form of the US, of Americans and Europeans. And it's really important that you understand that the Chinese are very, very different than the US and the Europeans. They're not playing by the same rules at all. And so understanding where they're coming from is actually very important. And then the second part is to understand where does Africa fit within China's broader uh, you know, priorities? And when we look at Africa's role in the world for the Chinese, 
it's actually the least important trading region of all regions in the world for the Chinese. So what do I mean by that? I mean the fact that when we look at China is a $4.5 trillion trading power. Every year it does about $4.5 trillion in trade. It is the largest trading country in the world. Last year, China, Africa as a group did $187 billion of trade with China. And most of that trade is concentrated in just 10 countries that are largely the extractive countries. And so when we look at Africa, the continent, it looks good. 187 billion is big for Africa, but for China at 4.5 trillion, it's actually the least of all the different regions. In fact, China does more, does about double the trade with South America. It does 240 billion with the Middle East. And here in Southeast Asia, where I'm at, it's $1.2 trillion. The point here I'm trying to make is that most of what China buys from Africa, which is oil, mineral, and timber, the vast majority of that, it can buy elsewhere on the Belt and Road today. That was not the case 20 years ago when China first came to Africa, but today it is. There's very little that is unique to Africa that the Chinese can't buy somewhere else. However, there is one product that they need more than anything right now, and that is cobalt from the Democratic Republic of Congo. And the most important geopolitical relationship that China has in Africa today, it's not in South Africa, it's not Nigeria, it's not Ethiopia, it's not Djibouti, it is Congo. And so the events that have been unfolding in the DRC over the past six to nine months are the most fascinating and interesting to see how the Chinese are making huge investments into the Congolese mining space. And at the same time, the Congolese government is pushing back very hard to renegotiate the contracts and to try and get a better deal uh, out of the Chinese. At the end of the day, there is not a single expert out there that we've spoken to who doesn't believe that the Chinese will be the dominant player in the Congolese mining sector and the Chesakati government is going to be a lot richer at the end of this process. The fundamentals will not change. But there is a very fascinating, delicate dance that is going on right now. So I invite you to focus attention on what the Chinese are doing in the DRC. Conversely, uh, there's been a very big shift just in the past couple of weeks. It affects our friends in Zimbabwe and South Africa the most, uh, which is the that Chinese President Xi Jinping announced that China will cease building coal fire power plants and will no longer fund coal fire power plants. This is particularly devastating for Zimbabwe where they had a $3 billion commitment to fund the Senghua power plant. Also, the Huangge power plant was also going to be uh, what's mostly done. It's about 80%, 90% done. But it means that future investment in coal in Zimbabwe will not happen. There are about five major Chinese power plants that were going to be developed by the Chinese worth billions of dollars. And the key question here is that if it's not coal, something that's abundant in many African countries, from Botswana to Zimbabwe and elsewhere, Will the Chinese then come through with sustainable funding for other new cleaner development and cleaner energy sources? We don't know. And, and this is one of the areas where, again, where we have to see improved civil society pressure on African leaders to start negotiating better deals with the Chinese in order to get these sustainable types of energy and resources and a more sustainable trade. It, it does not look like that African leaders uh, are doing a very good job in many cases of negotiating the contracts. And one of the key things when we talk about the loan deals that Cobus talked about is too often in the coverage, Africans, and this is African coverage I'm talking about, African media portrays African countries as somehow being victimized by the Chinese. The Chinese are doing this to us. And, and the key question here is, there is absolutely nothing stopping any one of the parliaments in Africa from voting laws and creating laws that say all loan contracts with every foreign power must be made public and must be scrutinized. Right now, it is the Kenyan attorney general who is fighting against the release of the standard gauge railway contract. It's not the Chinese. So when we look at these deals, Africans are not the victims here. And that's a very important part of the narrative that is missing here. Africans have agency. African governments are complicit in this. African civil society has a voice in this. And too often the narrative is simply boiled down to, well, here we go again, another foreigner is taking advantage of us. And so the last point that I'll make is that there is absolutely nobody putting a gun to any African leader's head to sign these loan deals with the Chinese. 
This is not colonialism 2.0. This is not resources and, and laws and things being forcibly extracted from Africa the way it was in the past. So again, on the news coverage of it, more accountability for African governments and what are they doing? You as African taxpayers have a right to know where your money is going and what the terms of those contracts are because you are going to be paying for it, your children are going to be paying for it, and your grandchildren are going to be paying for it. And that is missing from too much of the coverage. I'll leave my, my, my comments there so there's time for Q&A. Thanks very much, uh, Eric and Kovis, for those um, key points to the key topics to look out for when reporting on Africa-China relations. And I think it's very important what you said right at the end on um, the fact that Africa has agency and should not be um, portrayed as a victim of China. But I'm just going to remind our attendees that if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to uh, post them under the Q&A and chat um, functions here on Zoom or on the Wolver app. Um, I'll now proceed straight into my presentation. I'm going to be uh, presenting the hybrid training strategy um, in the era of COVID-19 adopted by the Africa-China Reporting Project. And just before I go straight into it, I'm just going to give a brief introduction of um, the project. So we were, uh, we we're based at the Center for Journalism at the University um, of Advertisement, and the project was established in 2009. And that was coincidentally the same year that uh, China surpassed the United States as um, Africa's largest trading partner. And there, there existed a gap in knowledge and information on Africa-China relations and, and how that came about. So um, this filtered through the media, which was um, highly polarized and biased and Western narratives dominated the space and without Africa's or China's uh, perspectives. So the project was established uh, with the premise of providing facilitation and capacity building for journalists uh, via reporting grants and training workshops and other opportunities um, to enable journalists to investigate these uh, complex um, dynamics and uncover untold stories um, and focus on the local on the ground community impact and perspectives to illustrate how the lives of the people of Africa are changing amidst um, Africa-China interactions. And so uh, since its establishment, the project has awarded over 200 reporting grants. And this year alone, we awarded 40 um, reporting grants, which is a record high for the project's um, annual disbursement of grants. And we've also trained over 150 journalists providing skills development um, in workshops that have been held in South Africa, in mainland China, in Hong Kong, um, in Ethiopia, in Cote d'Ivoire, and this year in Malawi and Nigeria and um, Zimbabwe. So as an African-based institution, um, the project seeks to amplify African perspectives by enabling journalists to tell the continent's stories and to enhance its development by facilitating a nuanced understanding of its engagement with China. And so the project has shaped up to be um, a networking hub for policymakers, for business people, for journalists, academia, and other organizations. And on the right, um, the image is of a study that was conducted by the Communication uh, University of China, which recognized um, the Africa-China Reporting Project as a unique and impactful um, and only project of its kind. So one thing that doesn't need much introduction is the COVID-19 pandemic and the crisis has been felt globally. And I think before the end of 2019, no one would have ever imagined a, a global virus disrupting the way of life and work. However, it has deeply entrenched um, its place in the world and Stats SA calls it the biggest disruptor since World War II. And attesting to this, we have seen um, a great global shift and influence to sectors and industries and even um, government relations and health systems have been tested and 
economies have been affected and education and teaching um, has experienced some um, extreme challenges and there have been uh, losses in employment and effectively uh, faith in government leadership has dwindled. And the pandemic has exposed the realities of our socioeconomic structures showing high in inequalities um, among other things. But the relevance being relayed for the purposes of this presentation is the impact on the media and the project's work to curb these challenges. And last year, um, a, San a SANF report published um, the impact on journalism um, by COVID-19 and stated that the, pandem the pandemic has effectively taken away um, that pie, um, which, sorry, that pie, which, um, what they're referring to is um, uh, advertising revenue, which is used to uh, sustain media houses. So it became prevalent that there's never been a crucial time to be uh, supporting journalists um, than now. And though this time presented a challenge for the project, as we were not able to um, hold actively in-person workshops, which involve um, traveling of journalists and facilitators as per usual, but it also presented an opportunity uh, for the project to implement more dynamic ways to continue to support journalists even um, within the limited frameworks um, of the pandemic. And so um, that is the um, Africa China Reporting Project's hybrid training start strategy. Um, it is to maximize online um, and offline training into a coherent whole to navigate the restrictions of the COVID-19 era and to still provide facilitation and capacity building to journalists. And this involves um, six collaborations um, to the hybrid strategy listed on the right. And these uh, include public health reporting grants that were awarded um, Africa China Reporting Project webinar series, um, our training website, uh, collaborations for training um, workshops, and collaborations with independent investigative units and independent researchers. So um, what was important and most immediate was is the pandemic itself and the reporting around it. So as not to only support journalists with reporting grants, but to also um, inform society and unpack how African communities are being affected uh, by the pandemic. And this was especially um, because the virus was firstly uh, experienced and unpacked in parts of Asia and Europe. And so the media and reporting on the virus was dominantly from these regions. And so it, was, it is important to enhance um, Africa's ability to investigate um, and tell the stories on how um, the continent has been affected by, by the pandemic. So journalists investigated um, ground level responses on capacity, on successes, uh, failures, shortcomings and health systems, lessons from previous outbreaks, uh, data reporting, technological developments and the sort. And in total, the project awarded 31 reporting grants to journalists um, across Africa the countries are listed on the slide and um, on the right is an example of some of the publications that um, came out of these um, this call um, and um, they weren't only print um, um, publications but there were also documentaries and this is um, an, a doc documentary which was conducted by a Nigerian journalist and um, it reports on the impact of COVID-19 on internally displaced people and and children um, in Nigeria. And these are also some of the examples of uh, publications with, which came from um, the Public Health Reporting Grant series. Um, and I think it's worth mentioning that the two-part um, investigation on how years of poor health care funding affected Nigeria's response to COVID-19, um, which was published in the Nigerian Tribune, um, it was later awarded, um, it was actually awarded this year in January, um, it was awarded by the Nigerian Health Watch and received the Prevent Epidemics Nigeria Journalism Award in print 
and digital news um, in the print and digital news category. So um, this was a good indication of, of the impact of these uh, reports. And um, this was followed by a, a webinar uh, series which discussed all the publications that came out of um, the public health reporting grant series. And um, this leads me to my next item, which is the projects webinars that um, we've hosted um, ever since the, the pandemic. So um, this was the first for the project because um, we've never held web, um, webinars before, but uh, we swiftly learned um, the technology and we were able to host 12 webinars um, from 2022 this year and they were on various topics um, listed um, on this slide and the webinars presented benefits of a more global outreach and a greater impact and also um, they are a lasting resource for journalists and researchers because they can always go back to um, listen in again and gather that information that would be um, useful for the 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 the, the investigation that they would be conducting or whatever information they are looking um, to use. Um, then next is the, oh yeah, so these are the um, some examples of our webinars that we held and some of them were practical. So they gave practical insights on how journalists can prepare good proposals, uh, how to report on wildlife protection issues in Africa, um, how to protect yourself and your data. And then some of them were more of um, information webinars or, and um, um, discussions such as experiences of Chinese journalists and their reporting in Africa, regional African journalism roundtables, and um, a regional roundtable on um, Africa-China relations and COVID reporting. And also um, there was some on um, um, studying um, vaccine reporting in Africa and um, some collaborations with the, the VIT Center for the Study of the United States, which looked into um, Africa-China and US relations um, under the Biden era. And there were some publications which came from that webinar. And also we held a book discussion on a new book that was published um, this year. And that was the South Africa-China relations, a partnership of paradoxes. Um, then uh, the project developed um, a training website, which is um, dedicated to journalists and resources and provides uh, uh, journalists and researchers and provides free resources um, for, for, for um, everyone who wants to um, get some information or, or, or resources on how to report on Africa-China relations. So these um, include uh, reporting guides, themed investigative topics um, um, and workshop training resources and, and um, expert uh, discussions. And the resources that are shared on our training website were um, collated in collaboration with our partner, um, the China Africa Project. Um, so I'm just gonna quickly run through this video for the purpose of time. It's just um, showing um, the, the sections in the training website um, and what you can look out for for um, any resources that you require um, when conducting your fieldwork or um, trying to get some information. Um, then we um, held collaborations for training workshops and I think this was the more impactful um, um, section in our hybrid training strategy because of um, the impact that, that, um, um, that came out of it and 20 journalists were trained um, in, 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 in the, on Chinese uh, overseas lending using the case study of um, the Standard Gauge Railway in Kenya. And 27 journalists were involved in virtual and in-person um, journalism workshops 
which were held in Nigeria, Malawi, and Zimbabwe. And these uh, were a great success. And the organizers will be speaking um, specifically to these workshops and everything that um, was learned from them. So um, we're looking forward to those presentations that will be following mine. And um, so the, the workshops were uh, highly informative um, and uh, built the capacity of the journalists who participated and um, also presented a, a networking opportunity for them. And the fact that they were also um, held virtually means that um, um, the contents of the workshop will remain a resource for other journalists or researchers who were not um, able to attend, but can all um, participate or look up on the workshops on our website and training website um, to get that training specifically as well. Um, then we also collaborated with independent in investigative units, and this was a new approach um, apart from awarding individual reporting grants, um, but to also award um, 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 investigative units for a more impactful reporting and to support and, and enhance and, and sustain the, the important and the brave work that is done by investigative units in Africa. And partic particularly uh, within the existing and new challenges um, that they are facing. And so um, in, in, recent, uh, in a recent publication that is on the right, on mapping of investigative journalism hubs in sub-Saharan Africa, which was published by AIJC early this year, we see a new wave of these centers developing in, in the region. And the map um, shows 32 investigative centers have been established in 19 um, countries in Africa. And so this is an indication of the heightened um, resurgence of investigative reporting in Africa in the recent years. And, and most most of them coming outside of um, traditional newsrooms. So we received a great response from the nine investigative units um, that are listed on the left. Um, and we look forward to, um, to, their, to their publications. Then um, lastly, the project uh, collaborated with six in-depth um, researchers for more in-depth studies on Africa or Africa-China um, related um, issues. And the project continues to award general reporting grants on proposals that um, are defined by the journalists. And on the right is a um, academic publication um, from York University in Canada, which examined reports on China-Africa relations and the support provided by the Africa-China reporting project to enhance news coverage and contributions to public knowledge. So this is a strong indication of um, the impacting nature of the Africa-China reporting project. And so in conclusion, this would not have been possible without our new and existing partnerships with our donors, with stakeholders, media and research organizations who continue to work um, with the project in advancing and unpacking issues within society and those particular to Africa-China relations. And also most importantly to our network of journalists and professionals who continue to follow and take up the opportunities that are presented by the project. Um, as we train a small group at a time, we impact on improving the skill set of journalists, not only to, to be able to report on Africa-China relations, but to be able to advocate um, for an in-depth understanding um, and appreciation of Africa's positioning as it um, continues to interact with the rest of the world. And the fourth estate is a crucial element in our governance and society and must be sustained by all means possible. And we found that um, not um, that although COVID-19 presented challenges, it also brought um, some benefits and opportunities of reaching to a more global um, 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 audience and engagement. And we were also positioned um, within a journalism center at a globally renowned um, Fitz University. So it's a rich and resilient community that is committed to enhancing Africa's pioneering futures. So, um, 
continue to, to engage with us and follow us um, on our platforms, on Twitter, on Facebook, LinkedIn, subscribe to our YouTube and our newsletters and our websites. Um, and, jo and join our, our network and collaborate with the project as we continue to support and build the capacity of journalists who are reporting on Africa and on Africa's engagement with China. Thank you so much. Thanks, Collins. Um, I think you can go straight ahead to your presentation. We had a workshop in Malawi on Africa-China uh, relations in general, and then Africa-China relations in particular focusing on Malawi. I think we had the local experts from a local university that tackled that issue. We had 10 local journalists, and these journalists were selected, one, on the basis of the strength of their news idea, two, the type of media, and the three, jurisdiction, because we, some are coming from community radios, national radios, national TVs, national newspapers. That's how we did the selection. And then on top of that, five of these, we've awarded them grants. And these were also part of the workshop. So in general, the workshop tackled um, Chinese contribution to Malawi, uh, development aid to Malawi, a brief overview, and then a summary of the development assistance and investments to Malawi, and then opportunities and challenges that are there in the relation between uh, Africa and China, but particularly focusing on Malawi. This was one aspect of the training, but it also tackled on the tips to investigative journalism, uh, how journalists can pitch their stories. We also tackled them um, how, <clears throat> how, how, they can, how, how, how they can avoid defamation and libel, and also how they can write good stories in general. But uh, we also tackled how give them 10 practical tips for government development because the, the other part of the Africa-China relations uh, stories is development. And we cannot run out from that, development journalism. So these are some of the practical tips we give to the journal to say, this is how we can cover development, whether it's Africa-China relations, whether uh, any other development, but well, in this way, this is what, how they can do it. So these are the tips we said they need to broaden the development story. Development does not mean government stories. It's, they need to look at, I mean, they, they need to think outside the box and then not only take the government side or maybe uh, the project side. No, they need to, to broaden it, right? Uh, and also we said, humanize, the, most of the stories that are written even here in Malawi, there is no human. Uh, because development is about changing people's lives and then nothing like that. So we say, okay, put a person in the story. We need to see a person. What, what is the impact of that development? The perspective, right? These are the things we, and we say, they should focus on ordinary people. In most cases, we see stories that talk about big people. Big, we are the ordinary people because this the development is about these people. Yeah. When it, uh, ordinary people are, are portrayed in the media, mostly it's about maybe the victims or maybe beneficiaries of, of we don't want focus. What is the impact? What, what, what is this development doing to these people, right? So we're saying these are the tips we gave to do. And then uh, we, we're saying, uh, journalists should look for unusual angles. For example, there was a story in Malawi about in a, a government announcement that they are going to, to, to turn a, an old city into a new city and then build a new road. That's it. And then one, one journalist went and, uh, and interviewed ordinary people and he found that the much hyped development was not development because 38 families were going to lose their homes, 15 traders were going to lose their businesses, and then 125 hectares of land was going to be lost. So. If you try to look to say, the government said, this is what you are going to do. But if you talk to ordinary people, they say, no, we are not concerned and we don't want this. So we're saying people should try to look for the unusual angles, not the, uh, the, the, the usual angles, because that, 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 that cannot help. And we're also saying 
development journalism cannot be done on a desk. You can't do it by remote control. You can't do it by writing press releases. You can't, you need, you need, it's a must. You need to go out there and report from the field, right? And then you can complement this by re reports and, and, and other research materials, but you need to go and look for yourself, go to the field and, and look and report from the field. Make a reality, a reality check. That's what we're saying to, 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 to the reporters. And then we're saying sometimes we often ignore news, ordinary news. We can use those events to explain development issues, right? So we're saying for journalists, uh, writing development stories as usual or writing announcement is a thing of the past. So by weaving in investigative skills, good journalism, you can use these to find news angles to, to, to do development journalism. In the context, in this case, in the context of Africa-China relations and then focusing on Malawi, not actually uh, toying around, but look at, at this. And then we're saying, this is, this is another problem. Um, we're saying avoid technical jargon because mostly journalists, sometimes they write things they don't know they don't even understand themselves. So maybe if they don't understand themselves, it's either they can ask and then try to simplify for the ordinary people, but rarely they just copy and paste, which said, no, don't do that. Uh, some of this language is, is, is for those experts, development experts, but we need to, 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 to tear it down and say, okay, people should understand it. After all, we are writing for the ordinary people. That's what we, we, we use. And then we say statistics, you need to use them carefully. We gave an example of, we often heard that people in Malawi, they live on less than one US dollar per day, really. If we were going to go down to this, to examine this statistic, we'll, say, we'll find that it's not true. Maybe, maybe street people, maybe street children, maybe. But in Malawi, you find a family has got 10 cows, 20 goats, 10 pigs, uh, 50 chickens, and they sell eggs. One dollar here, one dollar here, you cannot do anything with this. So it was just an example to say, sometimes when you get statistics, try to find out where, where they came from and then try to uh, re-examine the, the validity of those statistics. And then you report in context and, and with those that ex giving an explanation. So we're saying they need to use statistics carefully, not just copy and paste them. They need to question them. This is some of the... And then we're saying follow-up story. I think this is a, a disease among journalists. We don't follow up uh, stories. We just write and then leave it there. I think by following up stories, we can, we can be abreast. We can, we can go on and say, okay, what has happened to this? We gave an example. There was a... Um, a white elephant project done in Malawi, which is called the Shire Zambia's Waterway. It never worked, of course, but billions of money were spent. About five years after the, the so-called port was built, another jeweler, another journalist did a follow-up. He went to the port and found out that it's being vandalized. People are melting out the iron and all those things. So it, it, without that follow-up, that story could not have been, could not have, could, could not have come out. From, from that. And then I was saying, this is of course, we journalists need to read and then everything, and then they need to stay informed. They need to broaden their, um, their vocabulary, their, I mean, their, their net wide, and then so that at least we need to, when they, they pitch a story, it's, you can understand it. Because uh, the problem we found with most journalists that even if they pitch, you, do, you don't understand what the journalist is trying to pitch. So this is uh, basically on top of all what I've said about Africa, but we're saying the, 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 the Africa-China relations focusing on Malawi, it's a development story, development journalism. So this, this is just uh, the, the, the highlight of what we, we did. Yeah, thank you. Okay.
Thank you very much, Collins, uh, for sharing um, the practical insights that was given during the workshop in Malawi for the journalists who participated. Um, so let's go straight ahead to um, Tawanda, who will be talking about the workshop held in Zimbabwe. Tawanda, over to you. So once again, thanks a lot um, to Wong Yue and uh, the AFRP team. Um, for giving us this opportunity to be part of um, the conference. Uh, also, thanks to AIJC21, the team. Um, Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe was chosen by SRP to partner in training on Africa-China reporting, which for us was a very um, um, uh, important um, um, opportunity it's a it's an opportunity that is uh, proven to be an eye opener and, and so on. So uh, what we did is um, after um, doing the partnership with uh, a CRP, we mobilized journalists uh, to to participate in this particular training intervention, and we had originally targeted ten journalists, but then we ended up with uh, thirteen journalists. A uh, 12 of who uh, attended in person, and then one was attending away from Big Falls uh, virtually. And then we had um, we had uh, five trainers. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll mention the trainers as I give you an overview or the highlights of the training components, uh, the training points. Uh, but then just a bit of um, background relating to information for developing trust. We are um, a non-profit organization we're based in Harare, but we've got a national as well as regional because we are reaching out into Southern Africa um, um, as well as a regional um, um, focus too. But we're capacitating journalists to, uh, to produce um, uh, investigative fact-checked uh, content a, a, especially around uh, governance, uh, corruption, but matters to do with uh, accountability. And our training took place on the uh, 29th. It was a two-day tra training workshop, which took place on, on the 29th and 30th of, uh, of um, uh, September, which is last month. Now, you see, we, so before, before we, we, we went in for the training, we, we, we actually did think this uh, out and said, how best can we then approach the training so that uh, we can, we can um, um, extract the best out of the intervention itself and then into the participants themselves. So, so then we said, whatever we are going to train the journalists on, uh, the training points must then converge uh, I, 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 I tend to call that, you know, the logical confluence and I am just so hoping that one day I'll be able to develop the concept uh, to balloon out uh, the concept you know, into something bigger. Um, whatever we, the training points we're going to do are going to bring out um, the capacity of the journalists to enrich, to enhance um, uh, the knowledge, uh, the appreciation, the uh, perception of the journalists so that as we move forward, uh, the trainees themselves would then be able, or at least some of the trainees would then be able to participate in Africa-China reporting at uh, various levels, uh, whether that's going to involve uh, information for development trust in partnership with ACRP, or uh, as has been the case uh, uh, prior to this, whether this is going to be an exclusively ACRP initiative without our involvement. All right. So, so then this is the point. Um, we, 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 we then went into the training. Let me just get to the slides. So we, we, we focus our training principally on, on, on the following. Uh, reporting, um, methodology, relevant tools required for effective and informed reporting on, on China, Africa. And then, um, and then we, 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 we focus our objectives, we structured our objectives around the following. 
which is very important. And this brings me back to the logical conflict that I was talking about. A, a better understanding of Sino-Africa Zimbabwe relations and um, the impact of those interventions or relations. It was always going to be very important for the beneficiaries to understand what kind of dynamics are involved in uh, the relationship between uh, Africa and, 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 um, and China uh, at the broader level, and then Zimbabwe at a more specific level because this was customized for, for Zimbabwean journalists. And then we, we sought to uh, uh, bring out a better understanding of the ACRP programming um, approach itself it, because there's no way in which the journalists know would have, um, uh, would have um, uh, uh, fully or comprehensively understood in what they were being trained on without understanding the ACRP uh, uh, programming structure itself and uh, the thrust of ACRP, but broadly uh, reporting on Africa, China. And then, um, of course, also we, we, we focus on uh, effective content production methods uh, and then how to pitch under the Africa, China reporting projects together with sourcing, but uh, this is what I'm going to talk about in more detail, but I'll be, even then, I'll, I'll, I'll seek to be bulleted because uh, of limited time. So we go to the training methods that we used. Because obviously every training uh, has got um, a methodology to it, so now, but I, I call the methods instead of just methodology. We had in-person uh, training that brought together, um, uh, well, I say 12 days, supposed to be 13, uh, 12 in-person uh, uh, beneficiaries, but then we had one, like I said, um, a trainee who attended from big boys uh, virtually. And then, um, and then we, the, our approach was very participatory, uh, uh, very practical, very interactive. And this was done in order to, to, enhance, uh, to enhance the perception of what was being trained among the intended uh, beneficiaries of the, of the training intervention. Um, because we don't believe that, you know, uh, just given the trainers the chance, you know, to, to, to do, to do uh, monologues, you know, would be enough as a, as a training intervention. So interaction was, was, um, was, was used quite uh, emphatically in that particular regard. So, so let, let me then quickly go to the training points or focuses. The, um, well, fine, yes, in this order, in that, uh, using that sequence, the first one was effective sourcing of information. And um, we had Eric Ollender, it's a good thing that Eric is here, who is the managing editor at uh, the Africa China Project. He presented on, on, on that. And then, um, and then um, the highlights of his uh, presentation, the highlights of his uh, delivery uh, include the below, which is uh, understanding Chinese media, understanding uh, Chinese propaganda, that Eric himself called um, um, information with a purpose, and then um, how Chinese news filters work in Africa, um, partly as, uh, as, as part of um, as that propaganda that I talk about, and then creating contacts, uh, especially with um, Chinese sources. Um, this is something that I found very, very useful because uh, journalists, especially here in Zimbabwe. Um, I won't say much about the other parts of Africa um, um, to that regard, but uh, we have tended to neglect so much creating contact with Chinese, uh, uh, Chinese sources and Chinese um, uh, yeah, information givers. And then, of course, he also did talk about open sources to say how important it was for journalists reporting on Africa and China to use open sources like Twitter and you know, the usual culprits. All right. So, so then after, um, after um, Eric, you know, yours truly came in, I, 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 I did um, a presentation. In fact, I had a two segmented uh, presentation. The first part of the presentation, but all is, um, uh, I mean, focusing on pitching. The first part of, of that was, you know, was pre precisely uh, focusing on the basic guidelines on pitching, which you would find anyway, anyway. Um, what comprises a pitch, what is a pitch, and um, what are the most important things in a pitch. And by the way, one thing that I wanted to, to, to emphasize here is that in our case, throughout, we place so much emphasis on 
especially the following two things, where pitching is concerned and where content production is concerned. The issue of using multimedia methods. Um, I am sure participants here will agree with me that um, the long form is slowly drying out. But that's precisely because as a storytelling um, a method, the long form tends to be quite boring, too gray, and so forth. So it needs to be livened up using other more uh, impact enhancing uh, techniques like uh, video, like audio, like cartoons, and so forth and so on. So this is one thing we really did emphasize that no, for those that are going to participate in our Africa-China uh, reporting project, given the grant that we already have, please let's try to make it a, a compulsory consideration to say, I'm going to present or to tell my story using multimedia methods and data too. So that was very important. And then of course, um, we said, um, it was also important for the journalists um, who would be pitching, but generally every journalist that you know, if this is not within the culture, by the way, in Zimbabwe, when people are pitching their stories, normally they don't include pre-reporting documentation to, to, to as evidence that you know, they've already done some work that would um, feed into the sustainability of what uh, they are going to produce uh, later on. So we did really put some emphasis on that, that no, when you pitch your story, not only uh, uh, going forward with this particular uh, project of uh, reporting on Africa, China, but when you're pitching a story, you need to also, you need to also show that you've already done some work. This would convince the consumer of your pitch, uh, of your story proposal. Uh, so we do really um, um, place emphasis on that. And then, of course, work plans, because uh, we have seen that um, most of the time journalists just dive into a story. You know, they they don't properly plan the story, and they don't do throwbacks into their into their work plans, even if they've done their work plans. So this is one thing we also we also uh, did emphasize. But then after this, uh, on the basics of um, teaching, we then customize it to say reporting under the Africa China uh, uh, project. Um, these are the expectations. And here I'm talking about the expectations of ACRP. I just um, I extracted that from the website, uh, from the notes that we've been exchanging with Perry and uh, Wong Yue um, uh, coming to this stage. All right. And then um, as part of that um, a logical confluence, we said um, it would um, it would make sense, and I think I've uh, already mentioned it, it would make sense uh, to, to train people without uh, placing some, casting some uh, attention on the nature of the relationship between China and Africa, and then China and Zimbabwe in particular. So then we had um, uh, Dr. Mugure is an expert, is a, is a, is a, is a well-known researcher in Zimbabwe, very active. He's a, a natural uh, resource governance uh, a, a policy expert, but he's done some stuff on uh, on China and, and, and stuff like that. So, so he also did a two segmented uh, presentation. The first, um, he was looking at um, um, the impact, uh, the, the the nature of the relationship between uh, uh, China and Africa at the broad level, and then China and Zimbabwe at another level. Um, and then after that, you know, he then looked at the impact of um, uh, Chinese interests, Chinese. Uh, uh, commissions, Chinese um, uh, interventions in uh, in Zimbabwe, but also in, in, in Africa, just to broaden the Chinese uh, appreciation or perception of uh, the training. All right. So then uh, this is it um, in terms of uh, that, uh, the presentation by Dr. Mungure, the social you know, economic impact of Chinese investments in Zimbabwe, as well as China's uh, China's relations with Africa and Zimbabwe. All right, and then another interesting uh, segment that came on. Uh, this is something we discussed with the training, with the trainer. I mean, um, uh, prior to prior to the training workshop, uh, the, the the trainer Kolani Nyachi is the editor of the Standard Newspaper here in Zimbabwe. We've been working together for quite a while. Uh, we agreed that you know it would be important for us to also get an appreciation of. Uh, how Zimbabwean media have been reporting on China before. And um, as part of that logical conference, you know, this would be important in the sense that you know, it would at least give the beneficiaries 
a sense of where we're coming from with our report, uh, reportage. But then, of course, um, and, and then we're identifying the gaps and uh, we're minimal on the strengths of um, our reporting. Um, th th that is according to the presentation that was made by, by Kulwani. Uh, it, was, uh, it was found out that, um, you see, reportage around China, Zimbabwe relations tends to be polarized in, in Zimbabwe. And uh, you got the public media here, or the official media on one end, and then you got the independent media. The official media tends to border more on propaganda. The independent media, while it's, um, it's a bit more objective, is also uh, approaching the China Zimbabwe uh, relations story uh, with some bit of bias. And then uh, we did emphasize that you know we you don't have to enter those stories with an attitude, otherwise, you no, know, that would compromise your, your your impartiality and objectivity, among other ethical ethical uh, tenets you know, that we we are always preaching about. All right, and then um, on the tools part now, uh, the trainer here also did uh, did that train on multimedia methods. Remember, I said. Uh, going forward, even with this particular project, we're placing emphasis on stories that use multimedia methods. So, so he did train on that, you know, and I think uh, it was very useful uh, to the trainees and to us too. Then we, then we also did um, a train on legal perspectives. Uh, you know, we, we presented on legal perspectives. Now we had a lawyer who came on board to to to, to give us a, an overview of the dynamics involved in um, in reporting on. For now, he presented uh, at a broader level, like he was talking about uh, foreign investments rather than particularly Chinese investments. But then, of course, a person, a people would then, would then uh, do their constructions of that broader uh, broader perspective that uh, the trainer uh, gave. So, so you, we looked at the constitution, um, how the constitution relates with uh, foreign investments and therefore also investments by China in Zimbabwe. This is very important because most of the time, you know, journalists do write stories, but um, they, they don't, they neglect a, a situating or locating their content within a, a legal framework. Uh, uh, to the extent that then they miss out on certain very important issues that are provided for by the law. And therefore, uh, it means you know, they would report uh, uh, incorrectly on certain things. So therefore, it was important uh, for, for, for the journalists to get at least a, a, a feel of what the Zimbabwean law says uh, relating to, to um, inward uh, foreign investments in Zimbabwe. Um, and then, and then, um, and then um, the presenter in this particular uh, slot actually did give tips on what to look out for when you are reporting on stories. Um, things to do with, uh, you see, if you if, if you have to focus on environmental uh, crime, uh, or if you have to look at um, frameworks involved in giving licenses to foreign investors and stuff like that. So he gave, I think, about four or five. A very useful tips in that regard. So this is the logical conference I was talking about, which we trained, uh, we trained so that uh, all the training points conference on building better capacity for the benefiting trainers. That is a better understanding of CRP programming and expectations, a better understanding of Chinese interests uh, in not only in Zimbabwe but in the region as well as Africa and the impact of that, and then a better understanding of story proposals and effective storytelling techniques, as well as appreciation of broader legal frameworks within which Chinese interests can be understood and reported on without bias. This is very important, without bias. All right. So yeah, um, we, 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 we did, uh, we actually did some evaluation, um, a post-training evaluation, but um, at a more broader level also did uh, uh, get feedback on uh, on the training. So um, one thing that um, came out, and I think and I'll just play shortly uh, a, a testimony video. One thing that comes out of that you know, is the journalists are, are testifying that you know the the gain uh, a, a holistic understanding of uh, 
reporting on Africa China. By the way, uh, all the journalists that we picked on have never participated in Africa China reporting uh, reporting interventions before through a CRP or any other uh, or any other platforms. So it was all, all, always going to be very very useful for them to get this kind of understanding. Uh, and then um, um, you see you see a, 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 a very heightened interest in reporting on Africa China after an understanding of um, of what's involved in that particular report. I must say in, in that particular training intervention, I must say at this stage that um, uh, the enthusiasm, you know, is, 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 is we are evidencing the, the, the enthusiasm at that practical level because we are, get, we are getting our queries from people, not only those that um, uh, 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 participated in our training, but outside, we just heard that we had a training session. They're making queries just to say, how, how can you also uh, get involved in, in, in this uh, Africa-China reporting uh, uh, process? So, so, so that's part of the feedback that we had. Uh, of course, some of it would be like long-term, short-term to long-term, but immediately that's what we, we, we had uh, without exactly having to, to uh, you know, beat our own drums. I have a a video here. I, I hope it's audible now. Uh, this is one of the trainees. The, the lady is just saying she found it very, very useful. So this is this is uh, how we did our training. And uh, on that note, I think I would have to hand over to the organizer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tawanda, um, for sharing the insights that were presented at the workshop. It was a very extensive program, and we're very happy um, to see that uh, the participants gained a lot of new knowledge and that you have some new interests um, from people who were outside of the workshop who want to um, engage with, with your organization and the project. So thank you so much for that. Um, now we're going to hand over to Khadija um, El Usman from Nigeria, who's going to be speaking about the digital rights in Africa and digital rights advocacy, um, um, talking to the workshop that was held in Nigeria. Um, there was a journalist workshop and um, part of the Digital Rights Academy. Um, Khadija, I'll ask if you can please um, try to um, quickly get through your presentation. I'm so sorry that we are running out of time, um, but please um, go straight ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you for the other presenters. Uh, it was fantastic and inspiring listening to you all, but um, I'll just get straight into it. So for me, um, so I'm here to talk about the tools and training from our workshop at Abuja, Nigeria. Uh, but my experience and work was a bit different from that of the other presenters. And um, I would tell you why. So uh, I wanted to give a background on what we do, what was taught, what were the tools, what were the skills and a summary. So at uh, uh, Paradigm Initiative, what we do is, our motto basically is to connect underserved young Africans with digital opportunities and ensure a protection of their rights. We focus on digital inclusion and digital rights. So um, basically teaching young people who have no access to digital technologies on how to use it and how to leverage on digital technologies to get ahead in life. And of course, we have digital rights and we advocate for this through um, just uh, general advocacy around human rights, strategic litigation, research, policymaker engagements, and so on and so forth. So you see, I'm, I'm trying to rush through it. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> But one of the reasons why we took this on with the Africa China Reporting Project is because we understand that in advocacy, we need the press, we need the media, we need journalists. Uh, after all, the role of, of the media is to inform and we understand their ability to influence public opinion. 
um, create and sustain any image of social reality that can bring behavioral change. So I, I, I suppose I need to say at this point that um, unlike those who have presented before, um, I'm not a journalist. I have no background um, in media. I'm a lawyer uh, who has spent her life working towards advocating for human rights. And with this, however, I have worked with a lot of journalists and have recognized a problem, especially in the country that I work in, which is Nigeria. Um, because journalists have a wide range of things to report around, at least from my area of expertise, we found that there has been a severe lack of information and knowledge around these spaces. And what we have seen happen is journalists uh, end up getting manipulated into reporting the wrong things. Uh, um, a, a short example would be uh, very recently, a minister of ours, um, he, he gave a directive that was against everything that human rights should stand for. And when there was a press conference, you know, because the press is always the first, uh, they're, they're the bridge between us and the government, the, the questions that were being asked were not, um, did not, they did not go to the roots of the issues. And those of us who were experts in the field could see that uh, the questions of the journalist was being twisted in a way that uh, made the policies look great. And this could have been avoided if there were collaborations between people like me in civil society and with journalists. We saw a gap and with the help of the Africa China Reporting Project, we decided to fill that gap because knowledge is power, information is liberating, and uh, education is the premise of progress, says Kofi Annan. Uh, so in my field, what are the biggest trends in Africa? We saw a rollout of digital identity projects. We've seen internet shutdowns. We've seen clamp down on freedom of uh, expression. We've seen misinformation and disinformation. Uh, so just going into the grantees, we had five men, five women. Um, our research or the research of the journalists was themed around digital identity and data rights. They were selected based on the strength of their research proposals and our work was to broaden their horizons on what it was they were to report around. I was very certain that after um, the workshop with us, uh, a lot of them would want to change the proposals they made because something I, I knew was going to happen. Uh, and just based on the proposals we saw was that they weren't, um, a lot of the proposals we saw and a lot of those that weren't picked did not have very in-depth knowledge on what was to be reported around. So what we do yearly is to have a digital rights academy. It's aimed at building the capacity of civil society organizations, journalists, advocates to understand, advocate for, and defend human rights on the continent. Um, it usually happens all over Africa, but of course, because of the pandemic, we had to restrict it to um, Nigeria. So what do we do? We roll out the knowledge. We um, provide them with a network of people interested in these things, advocates, journalists, uh, government organizations, academia, and we let them out into the world to put out all of that impact. So we had a room of um, 50 people from different stakeholder groups, and of course, our 10 very special journalists. This is just a brief, um, uh, layout of the things that we taught at the workshop, um, collaborative intervention, we covered business and human rights, women's rights, freedom of expression. We also um, covered how to communicate your advocacy and, and this also uh, was very important for the journalists. Um, one of the presenters mentioned using various multimedia um, various multimedia outputs, and this is necessary because a lot of people these days do not read. Uh, 
they watch things, they listen to things, and we need to be able to put this out in a way that people will listen to. Nigeria has 65% uh, of Nigeria's population is below 25, and we need to be able to put out this content in a way that young people would listen. We also taught them on digital security, data protection, and digital identity, ETC, it's all there. Um, so the final day, this went on for three days, but the final day was focused just on the journalists where we covered data protection and digital identity, but also um, things like disinformation and what the disinformation risk in Nigeria looked like and how to work through that. Because in the end, by the time they're done reporting, the people do not trust what it is that they have reported, then, well, it's against, I, I suppose um, it will make the work redundant. So uh, we spoke about disinformation risk. But finally, something that was very important that we did um, was to have a Q&A with previous ACRP grantees on um, what their experience was like, what their challenges were, uh, what were the tools that helped them, lessons learned to make the next set of grantees better at their work. And I found that they found that um, very helpful. Um, so tools that were used. So on, there, there were a lot of tools. So on digital security, what we started with was to play a game. Uh, we have a game called Ayata. Uh, it was, it's, it's actually a digital security toolkit, but it was a game for the, the delegates and the journalists to figure out how secure they are um, online. And it was just um, asking them basic questions on um, how they interact online and stuff like that. After, afterwards, they were taught on digital security and they went back to play the game. And then we saw that um, their scores were higher than it was at the start of the presentation. We also put together uh, various scenarios, various, various violation scenarios, groups, put them into groups and ask them to work with different stakeholder groups and come up with a response strategy and they presented it back to everyone present. Um, it was fun. Uh, no one was allowed to work with the same, with people within the same stakeholder group. So uh, one group that would have maybe seven to 10 people, would have uh, lawyers, would have journalists, would have a student in there, um, just to make sure that they get, got different experiences and were able to bring different ideas into violation response. Um, we also introduced them to various reports that we had done and tools of impact. And I think one that is, very important to note here would be uh, an application we launched called Reporty. It helps to, it works all over Africa. All you need to do really is use the platform to report any digital rights violation that we have, that you have seen around you. And then us and our partners all over Africa would pick it up and respond from there. Um, after, uh, they were inspired enough to volunteer to become one of those who would respond to violations um, as they come. Uh, so this is a photo of one of the presentations that was being made. Uh, after the presentation was made, um, I was just making a few comments on, on the presentations and ways that I thought uh, their violations response could be better. So this is just some feedback. I, I screenshotted some of the emails that I got afterwards. Uh, they were very lovely. Um, I, I see one here says the person felt empowered and inspired and felt that the, the workshop was resourceful. The person thought it was a great career changing opportunity, especially because of the networking and would use these skills to start advocacy within their own region. Uh, we got a lot like that, but I couldn't possibly put them all here. So, you know, just, yeah. Um, so next steps moving forward. I, I think I find that journalists need to investigate more, research more, 
um, on the, the topic of disinformation, and misinformation, we noted that particulates in Nigeria, a lot of people did not do, do not usually cite their sources. We have we have uh, 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 an attribution problem and a problem with citing sources. So we discussed this extensively and the policies that uh, and the transparency around the operation of journalists. Okay, um, and the transparency around the operation of journalists when they report in other to. Okay, I saw that my screen stopped sharing. I don't know if it's back. Is it back? Yeah, it's still sharing. Okay, okay. Uh, where was I? Okay, moving on. There is a lack of funding when it comes to investigations and research, which is one of the fantastic things about this project, because a lot of the journalists would not have had the opportunity to look into the topics that they did if they did not have the requisite funding. There is a severe lack of funding and it causes most of them not to go as deeply into issues that they should uh, when this is information that is necessary to bring societal change. And of course, finally, uh, one thing that I think we're really proud of from the workshop was that um, a lot of them, they were ready <laughs> to create their own coalition. Um, and and I, I believe they stayed in a, in a WhatsApp group together to share information. Um, and I, I got, afterwards, I, I uh, I got invited by a few of these journalists to speak to some of these issues um, on their various platforms, but I believe this is because they got the message, which was to collaborate. Um, you cannot know it all. You cannot have all the information. So collaborate with those who are experts in the field that you are writing on at the time. Um, I made myself available to everyone who needed it and any topic that is outside my reach. If I had access to anyone who can be helpful, I hoped to do that for um, any of the journalists present. And I believe they all made the commitment to collaborate outside their field for better information. Um, and hoping that I was within time. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Khadija. Yes, you were definitely within time. <laughs> um, so we're now going to just, um, I think we can only spend about 10 minutes for the questions um, that have been presented um, for our speakers. As we've run a little bit um, over time, we're supposed to be ending the session right now, but the organizers have given us 10 more minutes. So um, I believe there's a question on Wilbur, uh, Corvus. So maybe you can start with that. And then following that, there's a question on Zoom. Um, so we'll just read that after um, that has been um, responded to. Okay. So the question on Wilbur is, um, what major debacle can debau or disrupt Africa-China relationship, the Africa-China relationship, and um, particularly the business relationship. Um, so yeah, you know, kind of like I would like to, to kind of throw that open to to our, our, our speakers. Um, what like do you think there is such a kind of debacle that, that a single thing that can happen that would disrupt the relationship? Eric, can maybe answer that. I think the relationship is so varied and so complex and so multifaceted that it will be very difficult for any single thing. We've seen a lot of challenges in the past year to year and a half in the China-Africa relationship from the outbreak of discrimination against uh, Africans and African-Americans in Guangzhou in April 2020, which led to countless offensive videos on social media, to the rash of videos that we've seen of the maltreatment of African workers at the hands of Chinese managers. Again, that causes a lot of uproar. One of the challenges we face in the China-Africa relationship is that there's a huge gap between African civil society and the African governing elites. So what outrages African civil society is then insulated by African governing elites who wanna protect that relationship. 
And so long as there's such a big division between the people and their politicians, it's going to be very difficult to see how this relationship gets derailed. One other very quick point is that the economic relationship, as I mentioned, is becoming less important uh, going forward. Africa's value to China is not with the minerals and the oil and the timber that it can buy pretty much anywhere else. It's with the power of African votes that in supporting China's positions at the UN, at the World Health Organization, at the IMF, against the United States. So it's becoming a political relationship and not an economic relationship. And that changes the dynamic quite a bit. So um, thank you. Um, the next question is to Khadija. Um, and the, the person asks, how do you find working in different regions of Nigeria? Do you have more or less success in your advocacy in, say, northern Nigeria versus southern Nigeria? Uh, thank you very much. That's that's a great question. Um, so thankfully, my team is very wide. Uh, we have team members in every region in Nigeria, south. We have uh, team members in the south-south, northwest, uh, north central, uh, southwest. We don't have a team in the northeast. And then, of course, in other regions outside of Nigeria. Um, so, of course, the teams in those regions face different problems in terms of advocacy. Um, a lot of the teams there focus on digital inclusion mostly. Um, I, I lead the digital rights team here, but the, a lot of the teams down there focus on digital inclusion. And what we have found is, again, the, the problems could be very different. So if you go to a state in the Northwest, for instance, and you're trying to tell them, hey, you need to leverage on um, technology to get ahead in life. Some people might decide to send their sons and not their daughters and there's the whole debacle on whether or not um, the women need this technology and that might not be the case somewhere in, in another region. Another region would be more concerned with uh, what, what financial gain are you going to give me for this? Am I going to get some money for doing this? Uh, you know, so it really depends on the region but thankfully um, we have people from those regions who understand the context and work with the people on that. Uh, so it's not just me, it's a whole, it's a wide range of people and we, um, we come back and rub minds and find ways to move towards the obstacles that we have found. But so far, so good. I think we're doing a good job. Um, thanks, Khadija. The next question is to Collins. Um, how do you deal with uh, political issues in developmental journalism? For example, um, if you are unable to investigate hidden details about loans or deals with China that can cause great impacts on people's lives in Malawi, um, and uh, does it feel that there is a part of the story missing? Like, do, do you find it harder to, for example, I'm just extrapolating from the question, do you find it hard to report on the political impacts or to have to, to report on issues that, that would have a lot of political fallout um, in, in the country than ones that are purely economic. Yeah, thanks for the question. But maybe I, I, I need to emphasize that what we emphasize in the workshop is that we are not doing public relations journalism. We are doing investigative journalism, focusing on development journalism. We, we are saying, okay, uh, write anything, right? It's for the readers to judge. We are not saying this one won't write, this won't write. We are going to tackle everything that we find, it, it, as long as it hinges on development journalism. We are not doing PR for the for the Africa-China relations. No, we are not doing. That. We have uh, another like minute or so left. Um, so, if there's any further questions, uh, please feel free to post it. Um, on, on Zoom or on Rover. Maybe I, I can add that what, what we're teaching our, our journalists is investigative journalism proper. I think in Malawi, we have very few investigative people who do real investigative journalism. So I'm saying uh, follow a systematic approach, uh, find the story, and then the story will speak for itself. That's what I'm saying. Uh, I think maybe we can just um, direct a question to Tawanda. If 
as, as Tawanda there. Um, if you can just um, briefly uh, uh, lay out how are relations between um, Zimbabwe and China and, and, and why is it important um, to report on this relationship? What have you found? What have your journalists experienced um, in Zimbabwe reporting on, on China, um, China, Africa, China, Zimbabwe related issues? Okay, let me let me start off. Um, and I also be brief. Let me start off by saying that um, by referencing one recent research that says um, I, that was oh, that was done by this China has become Zimbabwe's biggest uh, uh, investments from China have become the biggest for Zimbabwe across the board. Uh, I think they're talking of about $10 billion. Now, this is at the hardware commercial level. But then even at the political level, uh, there's this increasing um, um, link between the Zimbabwean elite and the Beijing. Uh, and, and then, of course, you know, also via uh, the, the various or respective invest investors. Uh, you might um, recall that um, Zimbabwe, or rather the Zimbabwean government, the ruling uh, government, it adopted what it calls the Look East policy um, at the turn of the millennium. That's about uh, around uh, the year 2000. And um, the reason why they did that was because Zimbabwe was facing increasing isolation from especially the West. And uh, therefore, they, 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 they turned to, uh, to Beijing, they turned to China as an all-weather uh, all friend. So for, for the ruling elite in Zimbabwe, uh, China is dependable, is ever dependable, is ever um, reliable, is, um, is, is, is what in the global matrix, in the global order, is going to give them um, 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 some leverage in, in, in uh, world, world polit political dynamics. And then you see also that um, between Beijing and Harare, uh, I, I think Eric did say that, you know, and I did like the point, when he says that um, China is increasingly looking at politicizing its, relation, its relations with, uh, with Africa. And then the same is, uh, is happening with Zimbabwe. So uh, Zimbabwe becomes some kind of an outpost, some kind of a buffer uh, uh, for China against the United States, especially, but maybe other Western countries. So that's how useful Zimbabwe is to China. But then, of course, the Zimbabwean elite is also saying that China becomes useful. Because you remember that at one time, Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe almost like faced a legitimate UN sanctions, but China vetoed that. And so the, the ruling elite in Zimbabwe is very, very conscious of that. So therefore, this is the political matters that they... So, so you're looking at the commercial relationship, which is becoming more and more intricate, especially between the ruling elite local and, and China and, and Chinese companies. And then at the political level, you also this, you should, uh, see this intricacy as well. Thank you for that, Tawanda. Let me just uh, uh, do, um, give you a follow-up question to that in terms of the reporting. So how do you uh, best train a journalist who works in a state-owned media um, company in Zimbabwe and are bound to specific ways of reporting Africa-China relations? That's a question that's just appeared here on Zoom. So then how would you best train a journalist who is bound by um, this, the rules of the state-owned media in Zimbabwe? The emphasis that we place on unbiased, unattitudinated uh, reporting. So it would be very important to start off from there to, to remove this uh, perception of bias and polarization among us. And, uh, and then, of course, you know, to look at, uh, to emphasize the need for objective reporting. Afro, if it's the investigative reporting, then it has to be objective, verified information and stuff. But, um, but then, of course, you know, under ACRP, there have been journalists from, uh, from the state media that have uh, reported, and they've done that objectively. And I like some of the stories that, that they wrote, like Sydney Cowards, and I was searching the other journalists, so Sydney Cowards, you wrote a good story. Mm. Thank you very much. That's a uh, very good note. Uh, Corbis, I think then uh, that brings us to the end of this uh, training forum. 
It's been very informative and it's been great to see the work that's been done by our partner organizations, uh, training journalists and uh, continuing um, the, the ultimate goal of um, informing society and uh, advancing public knowledge. Um, I don't know if we should maybe allow last, uh, last words, just a few, and then we can maybe close the session. Um, yes, thanks, Bongiwe. Like just just from my side, just thanks so much. This is super in, super inspiring, um, and uh, you know this this work is is crucial for the future of Africa. So so thank you for everyone. Mm -hmm. Some last words from our speakers, and then we can close. Uh, for me, I think I would like to thank the Africa China Reporting Project for the support. I think maybe we, you you need to upscale it. I think there is. Uh, a greater need. We are getting lots of requests from journalists to they want to join the project and all that stuff. Thanks, thanks, Collins. <laughs> um, Eric, bye. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. <laughs> bye. Adija. <laughs> yeah, just um, thank you so much. It was a fantastic experience. Um, to be honest. I, I didn't know about the Africa China Reporting Project before um, we started to speak, Bongiwe. So it's been um, eye opening for me. It was very, it was different from what I'm used to. I loved it and I'm looking forward to collaborating with more journalists in the future. Thank you so much. That is an incredible note to end on. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you guys for the work that you put into the workshops that were conducted. We've received great um, feedback from the participants and definitely looking forward to collaborating with all of you um, again in the future. And to our attendees, thank you so much for um, engaging with us, sending in your questions and participating in this forum. Um, and yes, from me in Johannesburg, South Africa, um, goodbye and thank you so much. Thank you.